Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning. Please stand as you are able and join me in our brief order of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive uh, together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Please join me in the prayer of the day as found on the screen. Let us pray. Benevolent God, you are the source, the guide, and the goal of our lives. Teach us to love what is worth loving, to reject what is offensive to you, and to treasure what is precious in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Be seated for our readings. Our first reading comes from Ecclesiastes, the first chapter and assorted verses in, chap in chapter 2. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. I, the teacher, when king of Israel in Jerusalem, applied my mind to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to human beings to be busy with. I saw all the deeds that are done under the sun and see all is vanity and a chasing after wind. I hated all my toil in which I had toiled under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to those who come after me. And who knows whether they will be wise or foolish, yet they will be master of all, for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned and gave my heart up to despair concerning all the toil of my labors under the sun, because sometimes one who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave all to be enjoyed by another who did not toil for it. 
This also is vanity and a great evil. What do mortals get from all the toil and the strain from which they toil under the sun? For all their days are full of pain, and their work is a vexation. Even at night their minds do not rest. This also is vanity. The word of the God of, of the Lord. Thanks. Well, read Psalm 49 responsively. <clears throat> Hear this, all you peoples, give ear, all inhabitants of the world. My mouth shall speak wisdom. The meditation of my heart shall be understanding. Why should I fear in times of trouble when the iniquity of my persecutors surrounds me? Truly, no ransom avails for one's life. There is no price one can give to God for it. That one should live on forever and never see the grave. <coughs> their graves are their homes forever, their dwelling places to all generations, though they named lands their own. Our second reading comes from Colossians, in the third chapter. <clears throat> so if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. <clears throat> Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also uh, once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourselves with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all in all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Luke in the 12th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to devise it family inheritance with me. Uh -huh. Let's try that again. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, 
Who set me to be a judge or arbitrary over you? And he said to them, Take care, be on guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, What should I do, for I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Please join me in a moment of prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for planting in us the need of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us to receive it with joy, live according to it, and grow in faith and hope and love. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our collective hearts be acceptable to you, our Lord and Savior. Amen. How do you approach the worship service each Sunday? Are you expectant? wanting and waiting to hear God's message proclaimed? Or maybe a bit hesitant, afraid that the readings might feel like they're singling you out? Or like many, thankful for another hour of being able to catch a cat nap before the day's events begin fully. Personally, when I'm not preaching, I find the readings challenging and at the same time informative. Challenging to me as a listener, instead of how I would approach them were I preaching. And informative in that hearing someone else reading the lessons often sheds a new light on the words with the def uh, different inflections and tonal qualities of different voices. Are you listening, as you listen to this morning's gospel reading, what were your thoughts? My mind thought or my initial thought as I went through my readings early in the week went something like this. Why is the lectionary having an obvious stewardship reading at the end of July? It's not stewardship re season yet. Huh? This don't make sense. Of course, I'm, by stewardship, I'm talking about our individual giving to the church and such. But after reading through it, 
that passage a couple of times, a dim light began to dawn at the end of the tunnel. And no, it wasn't a fast-moving train coming at me. It's slow, and it took time to form. Jesus' parable about the farmer and his bumper crop wasn't about rural North Dakota having a good agricultural year and returning to God. His portion, although that's another sermon, it wasn't that about that at all. The parable was about the farmer and his greed. And just for grins and chuckles, as Pastor Colin and I were parting ways yesterday, he told me, what are you preaching on? I told him. He said, eh, I'm preaching on greed. So we're, uh, we're almost doing simultaneous preaching, me here, him in Eureka, just so you know. Got a two for one here. As you review the parable, you don't find any references to family, friends, or even neighbors. Read through it again. Nowhere is a family mentioned. This is coming on the heels of several weeks of hearing messages on good Samaritans and caring for others. The farmer is only being concerned with his own future and his own well-being. Much as I hate to say it, doesn't that sound a lot like our mentality here in America? We are all striving to get ahead of the Joneses, whoever the Joneses might be. My apologies to any Jones relatives out there. You're way ahead of me, okay? We all want the best things for our families, homes, education, food, vehicles, and that list goes on and on. The problems start to arise when the best isn't enough. We have quickly lost sight of the fact that God has already accepted us, you and I, as good enough. We are good enough in God's sight. And if we are good enough in God's sight, what are we trying to gain? I started thinking about this for a second. The only thing that came to mind was, I think we're looking for that choice corner lot in a gated community in heaven. We're trying to buy our way into heaven or something. And unfortunately, I've tried it several times. I've watched. I have yet to see a U-Haul trailer pulled into the uh, cemetery behind a hearse. Nobody takes it with them. Sorry. God is watching how we live with what he has given us and know 
that doesn't mean we have to live in sackcloth and ashes. It means caring for family. It means supporting neighbors, including those living around the world, to help them also begin to live up to our standards. It means finding contentment. Contentment with who we are instead of who our neighbor is or who our neighbor wants to be. It means coming to the full realization we cannot guarantee our own future. God himself has the final say-so in that matter. I feel fairly confident God is all in favor of us having a rainy day fund. It's when that rainy day thinking begins to take over our reason for living and suddenly storm clouds begin to arise on the horizon and begin to darken. Contentment is a difficult attitude to learn, but it's so important. It's easy to get caught up in the world's trap of working harder and harder to earn more and more when we may well already have what can provide us with the greatest possible happiness. What really matters is our relationship to God and our relationship to the people around us. Because as the writer in our Ecclesiastes reading this morning so eloquently said, apart from God, everything is vanity. Martin Luther once talked about vocation being a God-given gift, that what we do is a gift from God, so our doing it to the best of our ability is important. But it is the priority we place on our work that I'm talking about this morning. Are we talking about uh, <clears throat> what, <clears throat> excuse me, what we are talking about this morning is a balance between how much I have or want and contentment. There needs to be a balance in life. On the one hand, we need to take uh, need to work to take care of our families. But on the other hand, families need more than a paycheck. We need something more than a paycheck. We need to develop sound relationships. And the first relationship is with God and then our family. It is through our relationship with God that we can be content with what we have, content with our family, content with our lifestyle, content with how much money we have. The question becomes one of how would you assess your contentment level? Are you content with your life? 
Do you really want more? Are you content with how you're spending your time? Now, flip that over. If you had to guess, do you think God would agree or disagree with your assessment? Hmm. God already said, I am enough. How would you agree? Unfortunately, the, most, uh, the majority of us can agree that we still have some work to do to become content, <clears throat> as content as God wants us to be. Fortunately, until we reach that level of contentment, we can all thank Jesus for covering that difference between God's level and our level. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. For Jesus. Amen. Please join me in our offertory prayer. God of abundance, you have set before us a plentiful harvest. As we feast on your goodness, strengthen us to labor in your field and equip us to bear fruit for the good of all. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessings of our Lord. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon each of you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve our wondrous Lord.